This is the CRE Weekly Digest by Lightbox, a data and technology firm for the commercial real estate market. I'm Martha Kocher with Manis Clancy, Head of Data Strategy, and Diane Crocker, Research Director. For the week of July 22nd through the 26th, in equities, the tech rotation is underway as big tech earnings underwhelmed investors. In economic data, U.S. GDP rose unexpectedly last quarter. June PCE inflation came in as expected, and all eyes now are fixed on the Fed meeting next week for more signs of a rate cut. Manis, we began the week like we did last week with breaking weekend news that upended the focus on the markets. We saw politics in the news, crowd strike, but I think we're back to regular programming. What do you think? I sure hope so. It's been whiplash inducing these last two weeks. When you think about CrowdStrike last week, which was so disruptive to CTOs everywhere, IT workers, travelers, uh, baristas, right? They said that people were walking in trying to get their Starbucks coffee only to learn that their order had not gone through the Starbucks app. Normally that would be enough to dominate a week's worth of headlines. But in addition, we had As everybody knows, we had an assassination attempt. We had a vice presidential candidate selection. We had the sitting president drop out of the race. We have a new standard bearer in the Democratic Party. It's been really at a political level and and with CrowdStrike, just an amazing two weeks of news. It's almost like people have overlooked what has been a really painful reset of the tech market. You talked about people rotating out of tech stocks. Normally that would be dominating the headlines. We've seen many of the AI dark that had seen their stocks run up 30, 40, 50% over the last two months give back at least half of that. Firms like NVIDIA and AMD and Micron all selling off. And through it all, what we've seen is a real uptick in the number of CRE headlines, probably with a negative outpacing the positive by three or four to one. So you really had to keep your head on a swivel these last couple of weeks to really follow everything that was in the news. It was an incredible two weeks. I'm looking forward to a more sedate August. Don't forget, Manus, that the Olympics start tonight, too. There we go. My failure to mention that just goes to show how little I've been focused on things like that. Normally, that, too, would be dominating the news cycle right now, and that, too, flies under radar. It's just been an extraordinary July. And what I would say is normally volatility like this, when you see things moving as fast as they have been, when you see the NASDAQ, which had two days in the last two weeks, drop by 3% or more, that's usually not the friend of commercial real estate. Commercial real estate investors want stability of interest rates. They don't like a lot of volatility. Normally, when you see an uptick in volatility, you see an uptick in lending spreads, which makes borrowing costs more expensive. So yes, I I go back to what I said a moment ago, that I'm looking forward to a more sedate August, that we get back to fewer headlines, less whipsawing of the equity market, less whipsawing of the the yield curve. We saw the 10-year kind of bounce around quite a bit these last few weeks and get back to a, a normal cadence of, as Martha said, programming as usual. That would be terrific. Here, here. Manus, it seems that the big tech rotation, as we talked about, is part of a crisis of confidence more than anything. And, and it's something that we've seen in commercial real estate, which may have a silver lining in that it may spur the Fed to cut rates. That's a terrific observation that one of the impediments to the Fed cutting, I think, has been the fact that the S&P 500 and NASDAQ have been hitting new highs so regularly in 2024 that it's hard to make the case that we need a rate cut when the equity markets are on fire. And I think your point is spot on that those two days where we saw big, big sell-offs in the NASDAQ, and that doesn't happen very often where you see the NASDAQ drop 3% twice in a 10-day span, I think that may give the Fed the opportunity to say with more confidence, yes, we can cut rates. Things are not as frothy now as they were two months ago. And let's hope so. We've mentioned this before that in many cases, borrowers are really hanging on by their fingernails over the fact that floating rate loans have very high rates right now. Insurance insurance costs are through the roof. Values are down. And even though it may only be, and it's likely only to be 25 basis points in September by all estimates right now, that 25 basis points is, is beneficial. Any improvement, any lowering of the rates, any leveling off of costs, any lowering of risk premiums is helpful to borrowers. And many borrowers that bought in 2020, 
2021 into early 2022 are really hanging on by their fingernails, and that will be welcome relief when it comes. Let's turn to the big things we were watching this week, and one of them is properties that are heading to foreclosure seem to be making the news this last week. We've seen more of them reported. It does seem that way. The markets do move in fits and starts. A little bit of inside baseball about the markets is that for those that don't follow the CMBS market, a lot of the data that comes out comes out around mid-month between about the 10th of the month and the 20th of the month. So if things are moving to foreclosure, if things are moving to the workout specialist, if properties are transitioning back to the lenders, you normally have a bump up of that in the middle of the month. That news cycle can get very dense. But this month, it seemed more dense than usual. It seemed like they were more headlines about uh, borrowers throwing in a towel. And we're not talking about mom and pops here with $10 million properties. We're talking about properties that were once worth several hundred million dollars where the borrower is now capitulating. They're saying this is not worth throwing more money after. And the thing about commercial real estate is just like there's no crying in baseball, there's no crying in commercial real estate. It all comes down to the numbers. If a borrower looks at a trophy property and says, yes, by throwing in another $30 million, of tenant improvements, leasing commissions, I can get $60 $60 million in value back, then they will lean in. And if the numbers say, I'm throwing good money after bad, this $30 million I have to invest, or maybe it's $100 million in some cases, I'm throwing good money after bad. There's not much emotion there. It's really do the numbers pencil out and is it worth me leaning in here? And right now in the current environment, especially in office, people don't see the value in leaning in right now. And, and a lot of those headlines came out over the last couple of weeks and we'll talk about them shortly. So, man, as we have a few that you're watching closely, they start with uh, Manhattan and they take us uh, to San Francisco and Dallas. So let's walk through some of those examples. Yeah, I, I won't get into great detail on these. In Manhattan, this story comes from the real deal. Joseph Sitt, the developer who has been very active in New York for decades, it looks like he is going to lose two Manhattan properties. These are by the High Line on Manhattan's west side, a very hot area, actually, for a long time. He's going to lose two buildings to foreclosure, it looks like. In Los Angeles, the gas company Tower in downtown Los Angeles is heading to auction. That auction is slated for mid August. The property was once owned by Brookfield. This is not something that's coming out of left field. This particular property has been on the ropes, I think, for at least 18 months when Brookfield said that they were no longer going to subsidize this property. Now it's coming full circle and this property is on the cusp of going to auction. Noteworthy here is that the property has fallen in value by about two thirds, which is really representative of the type of reset we've seen in places like Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and in other places. Alex Barrera of the San Francisco Business Times reported that two San Francisco offices are also heading to foreclosure. Uh, This would be 222 Kearney Street and 180 Sutter Street. Back to the real deal, it looks like Tides Equities, who was a big syndicator in Dallas at the peak of the market, it looks like they're going to lose two multifamily properties in Texas in the near term. Lastly, uh, in Mountain View, it looks like Goldman and TMG are ready to surrender a big office campus back to KKR. This is a floating rate story. Once again, uh, Goldman and TMG took out a loan when rates were really low. Uh, Debt service on the loan has spiked to more than 8%. And uh, at this point, the property, which is um, almost 500,000 square feet at Ellis Street in Mountain View, formerly the head of LifeLock, that property is going to go back to KKR. So these are the types of things that can really influence sentiment. And I think that there was a lot of this over the last week. And, you know, not great for a market that's only starting to regain its confidence. Just jumping back to your gas company tower story, you know, and you mentioned that the value has dropped by, would you say, two thirds? That was, you know, just three years ago that that office was appraised at $214 million, And that was only three years ago. I just want to mention our colleague, Candy Coleman, has a blog out on the challenges of valuations, you know, and the fact that getting good and, and accurate and recent comps is near impossible. You know, the appraisal of that property was just three years ago, and it's completely obsolete now. It's appraising for more than 60% that value that it was then. So tip of the hat to the appraisers who are trying to do their jobs without having good, clear, accurate data. But I think, you know, every deal that closes, I think really kind of expands the universe of data that they have to work with in this 
this crazy market as assets change hands. I'll throw out two more stories as it pertains to noise or similar since you went back to Los Angeles. This one from Commercial Observer, Greg Kornfeld, he noted that 777 Tower, which is 777 South Figueroa Street, the note there is going to sell for $120 million. The debt on the property is almost $300 million, and this particular property was valued between $500 and $600 million a couple of years ago. So here you're talking about another 70 to 80 percent drop off. Bondholders there are going to take probably about $180 million to $200 million loss on that once this thing is officially sold and, and taken over. But it is a, of a piece and it, it's more noise in the market. And to that, I'll add one more, which is Blackstone this week on their big REIT, the REIT that has been in the news for the last couple of years over the, the issue of redemptions, people wanting their money back. It was a darling of wealth managers over the last three years. Put your money into this REIT. It'll give you 200 basis points above what you're currently getting on your money market or your treasury is wealth. Wealthy individuals plied into this. When rates started going up, people were pulling their money out hand over fist to the point where Blackstone had to limit the redemptions month over month. Now it turns out that they have cut their dividend 24%. So it's this type of noise that prevents a market from gaining its confidence. And this is something I mentioned to Martha, you know, during the water cooler talk this week in New York, I said, sometimes you have distress that's real. And these are real numbers. These are, this is real distress, but sometimes you can talk yourself into a crisis that you let these headlines become so all consuming in your mental space that you talk yourself into a recession. And, and that's the worry with commercial real estate right now, that these negative headlines become so overwhelming that we talk ourselves into a shutdown. And, and hopefully that's not the case. Agreed. It seemed like a lot of the stories that I saw this week were really centered around speculation with the a lot of the headlines that you just mentioned. And the thinking is, you know, is this a massive iceberg ahead where we're only seeing like the, the top tip with more down the road? Or is it we're seeing the worst now and then the market will kind of trickle back to normal? But I, I think this is really just the beginning of a multi-year effort as these assets change, as loans mature, as they adapt to the, the market conditions that are very, very different than they were just a few years ago. You know, I'll take a detour. Martha sometimes doesn't like my detours because they can meander <laughs> all over the place, but I'll do it anyway, because that's what I do. This week, it may even be today, I'm not sure, but this week is the trade deadline for baseball, the last day for which major league teams can trade a player. And you've heard this, you know, for decades that when a guy gets traded, he says, God, I can't believe they didn't want me anymore, right? Why did the Mets no longer want me? They, you know, they traded me to the Tigers or, or whatever. But the other side of the coin is the Tigers wanted them, right? There's both sides of the coin. The coin, right? It's not a one-sided street. And when you talk about the stress, and this is going to lead me somewhere, believe me, it's not just a meandering thing with no end. It led me to another story that, that I had. I wasn't going to talk about it, but I will. This is in Philadelphia. It's another story that is like the baseball player getting traded. In this particular case, the property at hand is a three parkway. It's at 1601 Cherry Street in Philadelphia. The property just went uh, for $30 million, and uh, that represents only $53 a square foot. Again, Again, another two-thirds fall in value. This property sold for $95 million in 2017. So in seven years, more than two-thirds destruction of value of this property. Yet, there's somebody buying this property. In this case, it's PMC. PMC expects to come in and take this 20-story building in Philadelphia, leave half of it as, as office. Half of it is occupied right now. That half will stay as office. The other 10 stories are going to flip to residential. And so here you have a situation where a borrower, and I'm sure that this renovation is going to cost them tens of millions of dollars, PMC is going to come in here and say, we are going to make a vote of confidence, a leap of faith for the Philadelphia market, and we're going to lean in. And so the, it's the parallel to the baseball player getting traded just when MRP Realty is giving up on the asset, right? They're saying, we don't see value in this. On the other hand, PMC is saying, now is the time to strike. This is going to be an opportunity for us to get an asset really cheaply, reposition it and profit wildly. And let's not forget, people are not looking for 200 basis points over treasury. PMC is coming in here, hoping to make 30% or more on this investment and good for them. Yeah, it's a great story. And I'm really interested to see how these office to residential conversions play out. Because like you said, you're not talking about a trivial investment when you're repurposing property from office to multifamily. I mean, there's a lot of work that has to happen and a lot of complicating factors, but there's also a housing shortage. And they wouldn't be doing it if they you know, didn't have some reasonable confidence that they were going to see their ROI down the road. So I'm really curious.
curious to see how these play out. So disappointed with that segue, Diane. I have to say that I tee you up with a trade deadline and the segue should have been, did you notice that the Mets have won 30 out of their last 45 games? And if the season ended today, they'd be in the playoffs. Come on. Wow. Like that's, forget <laughs> about crowd strike. Forget about the tech sell-off. That is the headline for this week. The Mets back in the playoff picture. Uh, underdog. Wow. And just to close out this segment before we move on to Lightbox data that we're reporting, we saw, to your point, man, as a story that was reported in Globe Street talking about JLL's office report, where basically they're saying that sales activity for office has improved in the first half of the year. And, and to the point, I think you were making that while there are some steep discounts, this is an opportunity with more flexibility for the new owners. And that was uh, one of the comments that that was made uh, by the JLL report. I'm glad that, Martha, you brought that up. Up. Nice to end what had been kind of a negative segment, talking about negative headlines on comps and office sales and foreclosures on a positive note. I'm not really surprised by this number, honestly. You know, JLL saying that sales were up 22% in the first half of the year. The narrative around the country is offices are toxic, CEOs at banks are talking about it, values are down. All of that is true. What is happening, though, at a pace that I have to say surprised me compared to 2008 and 1990, past very painful sell offs is that things are transacting. The market has found a bottom very quickly. The bottom is super low, but the amount of sales we're seeing every month is really substantial. And going back to Martha's silver lining phrase, that's the silver lining of this. The worst thing that you could possibly see in the office market is values being cut, broker opinions coming out at one third of previous values, appraisal reductions taking place, but the office is just languishing, sitting there, no investment, nobody wanting them. No no activity. The fact that these things are selling is a little perversely, it, it, it's a positive sign that we're finding our bottom and that, you know, things should not get materially worse, at least in terms of valuations. Exactly. And that's that's a great point is the psychological impact, because that's what really, I think, makes our whole industry tick. And whether I'm looking at data in our environmental due diligence index or valuation or property listings, I mean, offices is in the top three or four asset class in terms of where we're seeing quarter on quarter increases and where we're seeing year on year increases. So to your point, man, you know, it's not dead. We're definitely seeing momentum building as as assets move back into play. And one thing I I thought about when you were speaking is an email that I got this week. It was a marketing email asking me if I had capital to invest in distressed opportunities and, you know, if I needed an investment advisor. So I certainly wasn't getting any of those last year. Looking at some of the Lightbox quarterly reports that we're about to publish, we looked specifically at appraisal data in detail. Diane, walk us through what is happening in appraisals over the last quarter. We are issuing our three-part series of uh, second quarter market reports. I talked about property listings in the earlier pod. The second is environmental due diligence. So I'll do a few highlights on that front and then also valuation. The Lightbox phase one environmental site assessment index continued its second quarter of increases. The index reached 87.3 in the second quarter, and that was 10.3 points above Q1. So that really brings phase one volume in line with where we were last year in the second quarter. And it's important to note that reflects work not just on the lending side, but they're also doing environmental due diligence for investors before some of the big deals that you just covered, Manus, as well support for M&A and other types of transactions. And, you know, Manus, the foreclosure stories that you mentioned, and I think really kind of lend a real world perspective to the outreach I've been doing with Lightbox customers on the environmental side. They're gearing up definitely to support work related to foreclosure efforts, as well as work with special servicers, loan workout groups. So I do expect that we'll see an uptick in projects that we're seeing and some upward mobility in our index numbers in Q3 and Q4, and even longer term as the type of activity and the, the stories that you just highlighted really pick up. And then Martha, to answer your point, rounding out our trio of second quarter snapshot reports is the third one, which is focused on lender-driven valuations. So here, the Lightbox Appraisal Index came in at 63.3 in Q2, and that was a gain of 1.8 points quarter on quarter and very little change from last year. Year-to-date commercial appraisal volume from lenders was at $110 million at mid-year, and that was versus $109.4 million last year. So, you know, we're really just looking at a very moderate 1% blip 
a year on year. But what was interesting is that the progress wasn't steady. It was really, really choppy in terms of monthly fluctuations. So April and May, valuation activity spiked only to slip in June, landing below what we saw in January, February. So it's been very volatile on the lender appraisal front. And we talked about asset classes just a little bit before when we were running through the office headlines. In terms of lender-driven appraisals, retail took the lead in the second quarter with 22% of total projects. And that was followed by industrial with 17%. And then office and multifamily each took 16%. So office appraisal work is is the significant piece of the pie. And that's, you know, due, I think, to some of the newsworthy office deals that that you just highlighted, Manus. So, you know, I think it's clear that in the appraisal sector, like in really in the broader commercial real estate market, everything's improving in different degrees compared to the doldrums that we saw last year. But I think in this particular segment, until um, Powell begins to drop interest rates, I don't think we're going to see any kind of meaningful boost in originations and therefore the lender-driven appraisal data that we're looking at for our index. Yeah, this is the, I'll, I'll slide into the shameless plug part of this podcast. I've said this on LinkedIn and on Twitter and, and so forth. I do think that this particular reading, set of readings, the activity indices in appraisals, environmentals, at some point will add zoning to it, market listings and so forth, will be a really important set of numbers to watch going forward for inflection points. I think when we get to the next frothy period in the markets, whenever that may be, and it may be a couple of years off. This will be informative to people as to when risk is getting ahead of, or I should say emotion is getting ahead of risk management, right? Markets are getting too frothy. And I do think what we've already seen is we've seen kind of the inflection point at the bottom that we saw that these indices really kind of crater in fourth quarter 2023. And I think we'll look back and people will say, well, that was a really good time to put money out to work. Okay, we've got a lot more news to cut through. Leasing, selling, buying, lending. Let's start, Manus, with who's leasing. I know we're going back to New Jersey, one of my favorite places. Yes, we have some good stories in here and some not so good. We'll go through them very quickly. In Jersey City, Lafrac has renewed Fidelity Investments for almost 200,000 square feet. Good news there. We've seen so many firms really downsize, especially in big markets. Good on Lafrac for nailing this renewal. That story from Joshua Bird of uh, Real Estate New Jersey. In San Francisco, the story is not uh, quite as positive, but it's also not a disaster story. From the San Francisco Chronicles, Roland Lee, Google has renewed its lease for 64,000 square feet at 215 Fremont Street. That's owned by Clarion Partners. The upside of that story is you get a renewal of 64,000 square feet. The downsize is that the renewal is only 50% of the space that they had prior to this renewal. So a downsizing from Google in San Fran. Of a similar piece, Meta is going to shrink its offices in downtown Denver. They're going to downsize by about half at the Maryland New Tower Trust Building. Again, a negative story there. Back to a positive story. Investment manager Aries, big CRE player in the debt space, offering bridge loans and MES loans and stuff like that. They are moving their offices from Park Avenue, 345 Park, a little bit further south to 245 Park. And in the process, they're growing their footprint by more than 300,000 square feet. Real good news there for the New York market, which could always use more good news. And in Stamford, Connecticut, this comes from Elizabeth Cryan of The Real Deal. Indeed, you see their ads all the time. They are the people that post resumes on behalf of companies to hot try to attract talent. They're signed a lease for 124,000 square feet at the link in downtown Stamford. So good news there in that market, which has had its um, share of bad news over the last decade or so. Yeah, and I think those stories, man, they highlight two things. You know, one is the the trend of downsizing the office footprint, which, you know, we've read so much about in recent months, but these are real world examples of that happening. And I think in Stanford, the Stanford story really kind of illustrates how different one metro can be from another and how different it can be from just a few years ago. Nobody wanted office space in Stanford years ago, and now they have these new renovated Class A spaces. You know, you didn't mention that the, the property has a golf simulator 
and an outdoor space with fire pits. I have a broker friend in Stanford who can't find enough office space for the inquiries that she's getting. And I, I know the one you mentioned was an in-city move, but you know, there's this kind of migration of office le leasing going on up 95 from Manhattan. And I think if the space has amenities like this one, it makes it that much more appealing to, to users. I think back on how amenities have changed over the last years and the things I appreciated when I was younger in my career. And the one amenity I loved, this is going to give away my age and the way I think about things. We used to have a shoe shine guy come to our floor at 477 Madison. And I thought that was the greatest thing ever. It was like a poor man's massage, right? He's coming in and you're sitting there and you're on the phone and you're getting your shoe shined. To me, it was like the greatest thing for a guy who was 25 and, you know, kind of grinding it out in Madison. Manhattan, you know, trying to make his way in the world. Having this guy come in and shine my shoes once a week, Theodore, was an amenity. I can't even imagine having a golf simulator. Let's turn to who's selling. And we've seen a number of regional banks report earnings that give us some insight into what they're doing with their office loans. It does seem like it is an orderly exit, Manus. That's a great way of putting it, Martha. This story comes from Susanna Cavanaugh of The Real Deal. She reports that M&T Bank was able to sell nearly a billion dollars in CRE loans over the last couple of months to reduce their CRE footprint. And I think the orderliness of the exit is a really important point to kind of dwell on for a minute here. When things are disastrous, when there are no buyers, when there is no liquidity and people are selling their assets at panic levels to the buyer of last resort, that is when you see banks start to fail. That's when you say there is panic in the air, that banks are cutting into their capital base hand over fist to stay alive. And instead, what we've seen over the last couple of months since we started this podcast are several big stories of assets being sold off large numbers, right? That B of A purchase of Washington federal assets a couple of weeks ago, $3 billion in loans at an average price of 92 cents on the dollar. That's, that's an orderly exit. And this is a very healthy thing. The fact that banks can get out of their CRE exposure, reduce the amount of CRE assets relative to tier one capital in a way that is not fire sale prices is very important. So good on M&T for, for finding buyers for these assets. The, the negative sign for this story, the other side of the coin, if you will, is most of these assets that they sold off were multifamily, retail, hotel, and healthcare properties. Those are the easiest things to sell. They didn't make a lot of headway in their office portfolio. And that kind of makes sense, right? There, it's going to take longer to sell. You have to shop around for a buyer. And even though they sold a billion dollars in assets, they only reduced their percentage of criticized commercial real estate loans by about 1%. So still more work to do, but it's good to see them able to tap the markets to get rid of some of their liabilities. M&T was one of five smaller banks that were downgraded um, just last March by Standard & Poor's because they had among the highest exposure to commercial real estate risk. You know, so this, as you said, is M&T's kind of first effort to whittle that risk down, even though they have more that they're going to have to get off the books. I'm sure the other four banks are doing the same, you know, and it, it brought to mind the headline that we talked about last week, which was, you might remember Marathon coming forward, you know, and saying, wow, what an amazing opportunity this is in commercial real estate debt. So one bank's vulnerable spot is another investor's amazing opportunity. And, and that's where the market is now. So we'll be watching these loan sales closely and capturing data on them and, and reporting back as we see other banks follow suit and, and get troubled loans off their books. I put a challenge out on Twitter this week. The pearl clutching about bank failures has kind of reached an epic level right now. People are saying yeah. we're going to see a dozen banks fail per week, a thousand banks are going to fail and so forth. And I put a marker out there, which maybe we'll have a, some kind of contest with our, with our listenership or so forth. But I said, if Las Vegas made a line of what the over under is on bank failures for the next 12 months, and that over under was, let's say 40 banks, 40 banks are going to fail over the next 12 months. Would you take the over the under? I would say, I would still take the under. I still think that this is going to be drips and drabs. We are not going to see even three a week going forward. And that's kind of my, my posture right now. It'll be interesting to see. Maybe Martha will have a marketing contest where people can pick their sides and whoever wins this thing will have a, a dinner in Manhattan for those that pick the right side of that over or under. It's already in the works. Lastly, let's talk about who's lending. You just talked about banks and how they're working through their CRE loan portfolio. And it's leaving an opening for others to get involved that we've seen. 
Yes, this was a, a headline I caught from the Commercial Observer this week. Invesco Commercial Real Estate Finance, which has only been in operation, I think, for about 12 months itself, maybe a little bit longer. I think the spring of 2023 is when it opened, has now surpassed $1.4 in loan originations. The article outlines where they're lending, and it's a, a pretty diverse set of assets. It's industrial. It's multifamily in Texas. It's a value-add project in Plano, Jacksonville, an acquisition loan in San Francisco. And I guess the, the reason this caught my eye is that for two reasons. Reason number one is it underscores the fact that people are still lending, even though there is so much noise out there in the commercial real estate markets. And when you look at where they lent, they lent into the highly criticized value-add markets in Texas, and they've done multifamily in San Francisco, which only recently lenders were taking back property from some big borrowers. And it just shows the fact that people are making loans right now and that even though banks may remain cautious, there are these alternative lenders there that are filling the gaps. We know that CMBS in the first half exploded in terms of taking market share. And we're seeing people like Aries, who we mentioned before, and now Invesco really leaning in and trying to take advantage of what Warren DeHaan once said to me, where equity-like returns with debt positions in the market right now because the opportunity opportunities are so good. And it's great to see. It should be a reminder that not all the headlines are negative right now in commercial real estate. Agreed. You know, man, seeing other lenders come in and fill the void is is definitely a positive, whether it's, you know, CMBS. I think I read that there were more deals in the first half in CMBS than there were in all of 2023. We also have clients who are doing a lot of work for MES lenders who are stepping in and, and the private equity ones like REITs that you just mentioned. And this last story from BizNow's Matt Wazalewski, I thought was interesting talking about lenders and looking for interesting deals and investors who are searching for yield are looking at some creative deals. One of the more interesting ones was mentioned by Dansker Capital Group CEO, who said his firm is conducting due diligence to finance its first nudist colony and that they hadn't seen it before, hope to not see it again. Interesting asset class, very high cap rates, limited buyer pool, he said. Maybe you know, when I was 25 and I was fit, maybe I would you know, offer to do the due diligence on that particular acquisition. Now that I'm 30 years older and you know much more dad bod than lax bro bod, I think I'd be passing that on, that, that due diligence opportunity. You know, Martha, one of the members of our new market advisory council shared that in Q2, their clients were challenging them with more complex properties that took extra research and consulting time. Although I don't think that that's exactly what he meant. No, keep your assets covered, please. I don't know. I think I show up to that thing and I get my own complex. With that, we will close. Thanks to our producer, Hannah Tebow. Please join us every week as our Lightbox team shares CRE news and data in context. You can listen on any of your favorite podcast channels. Send us your comments and questions to podcast at lightboxre.com. Thanks to all of you who have been sending us notes so far. We appreciate the note of confidence. So thank you and have a great week. Let's go.